heart should break for her family. Molly Tibbetts deserves justice. Her family deserves justice. But so does Christian Bahena Rivera. The defense position uh, is an interesting one because a lot of times you sat through jury selection and it was made a point several times that it's the job of the state to prove my client guilty. Oftentimes, you won't hear any evidence from the defense whatsoever. Oftentimes, the defense will just rely on the, the inconsistencies or the failure to investigate of the state. But that's not what we will do here. We won't just rely on the, the failure of the state to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. We intend to bring you witnesses, and that's because you need to hear what they have to say. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this case uh, is about a man that immigrated here from Mexico. You will hear about Christian's family circumstances and the reasons that he decided to come into this country. You'll hear about the differences in Mexico, that it's not just, you know, $7.25 an hour versus $12 an hour that someone can make for an income capacity. That the differences between someone that is trying to find employment in Mexico and someone that is trying to find employment in the United States, it's a fraction that a person can make down there. And although we've brought this case and we've talked about immigration, because we must embrace it. We must embrace that uh, the evidence here shows you that Mr. Bahena Rivera came to this country. You can agree with it, you cannot agree with it. You know, you can be Republican or you can be Democrat. But the evidence here that you must decide, the evidence here that you must rely on has nothing to do with that side issue. It's the, the black or the white socks that we talked about in jury selection. And what we ask you to do is when you evaluate the evidence, to set that aside. It's not part of the case. It's not part of the elements. It's just a mere fact that you must rely on. And what you must do is take all those other facts, take all those other things, whether you agree on them or you don't agree on them, and to decide whether or not you believe the evidence can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Now let's talk about this interrogation. You heard uh, Ms. Romero and I quibble between an interview and an interrogation. Now, was it an interview? Was it an interrogation? What you will see in this case is there's no dispute on the facts that my client worked 12 hours at a dairy farm, scoop and poop, cleaning grounds, and then at the end of his day, he was brought to the Powasheet County Sheriff's Office. Now, did he voluntarily go? Yes. Was he asked, hey, will you come down? Yes. But something that you must decide and something that you must think about from the evidence is whether this man this defendant here, a man who is a yes man, that's what the evidence will show you, go clean the stable, yes.
go do this, yes. Go do that, yes. And the evidence will show you that law enforcement came to this dairy farm. The evidence has shown you that they came to this dairy farm and everybody cooperated. Everybody just took a buckle swab. Everybody did what they needed to do, consistent with what they did that day. And you hear about this interrogation. And then it went on and on and on. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see the entire thing. Uh, it's in Spanish. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to hear the entire thing. It's in Spanish. But what the evidence has shown you and what the evidence will show you is that there was a systematic confrontation with my client. The first thing is he was talked to. You know, tell me about your life. Tell me about your family. Tell me about your daughter. Tell me about all of those things that are you, that are Christian Bahena Rivera. And then they started to confront him with the evidence. They confronted him with this videotape. They confronted him with these pictures. And they said, you know, we, we don't believe you. We don't believe that you weren't there. And the confrontation continued until it was put in my client's head, perhaps you blacked out. The state in this case, they got what they wanted, and they closed the case. They got what they needed. There was an intense amount of pressure, that's what the evidence has shown you, to close this case, to arrest someone for this vicious crime. And instead of continuing to work the case, instead of in continuing to work the evidence, they just submitted it to you. Now the first witness that you will hear from today is a Dr. Michael Spence. He is a DNA expert. He used to work at the Indiana State Crime Lab. He's done consulting work uh, in cancer research and other DNA evidence. And what he will tell you is that in that trunk liner, Molly Tibbetts DNA was found. But he will also tell you that there were other contributors, that there were other sources and that because only Christian Bahena Rivera's DNA was, test, was, was provided and Molly Tibbetts DNA was provided, because no other DNA was provided, those alleles, those, those DNA profiles are unaccounted for. We do not know. You will also hear from different witnesses that knew my client. You will hear about his family. You will hear about his life. And you will hear about his routine. This case, you've heard Mr. Freeze talk about different suspects. You've heard, you've heard Mr. Freeze talk about different evidence that was ignored or not looked into. And it is our job, it's our obligation to Mr. Bahena to bring forth to you anything that can cast doubt on the state's evidence. It's our obligation to you, to Mr. Bahena, to fairly, if we can, provide you with the evidence that does not support a conviction. Each one of you 
is an intricate person with very different backgrounds. Each one of you, you don't leave your common sense at the door, has a different story. Each one of you have different ways to look at the evidence. And what we ask you to do is to listen to our case fairly, to pay attention, and to remember that each one of you have the power to say no. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. I've got our first witness whenever you're ready. Uh, the defense may call their first witness. Thank you. We call Dr. Spence. Sir, can I get you to stop here and I'll swear you in, okay? Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Okay. Now, if you make your way over there, please, and be seated. Ms. Freeze, you can proceed when you're ready. Your Honor, before I get started, I would offer Defendant's Exhibit T, that is Dr. Spence's CV. Is that agreeable, Mr. Brown? It is, Judge. We have no objection. Defense Exhibit T is admitted. Please state your name for the court. My name is Dr. Michael J. Spence, S-P-E-N-C-E. -E. What is your educational background? I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Both of those are in microbiology, and both of those are from the University of Texas at El Paso. I then went on to uh, receive a PhD in molecular biology in 1990 from New Mexico State University. What did you do after you completed your PhD? I, I went on to work in what's called postdoctoral research uh, positions. Uh, first uh, for four years in uh, Vermont at the University of Vermont Medical School. Uh, then I went uh, for eight years to Boise, Idaho, where I worked at the Boise VA Medical Center. Uh, that was all uh, research on DNA, uh, mostly, especially as the years passed, uh, directed towards uh, cancer research. As part of your research, how many peer-reviewed scientific articles did you publish? Fourteen. Isn't it true that you have also completed a book chapter on forensic biology DNA? Yes. Is the chapter in press as we speak? I hope so. <laughs> I've been threatening to, to publish this for years, but I've been told that uh, sometime early summer uh, it should be coming out uh, via Thompson Reuters West, uh, and the, the chapter is called Forensic Use of DNA. So you start in cancer research, is that right? That's correct. And you move on to DNA, is that correct? Yeah, the, well the, the cancer research was mostly looking at uh, expression of DNA in, in cancer cells, that sort of thing. How did you go from uh, cancer research to forensic DNA, sir? Well, when, when I was finishing up in Idaho, that would be in 2003, I became interested in what was going on in, in crime uh, laboratory settings uh, with the DNA. Uh, so I started looking around at possible law enforcement positions and I settled on the Indiana State Police and they settled on me and uh, hired me and put me into their uh, Evansville Regional Lab uh, down at the southern end of the state of Indiana. Did they provide you with any specialized training when you transitioned to the Indiana State Police? Yes, uh, I was very fairly knowledgeable about how to work with DNA from the research, but I had a lot to learn about 
how things work in a police lab with things such as chain of custody. Uh, so I needed to learn about that and their, uh, how to lay out evidence and, and look for body fluids uh, and to do all the, the specialized steps uh, in DNA typing, which is to uh, uh, extract the DNA uh, and uh, um, quantify how much DNA is on each evidence item. Uh, and then eventually do the typing of the DNA and compare evidentiary DNA to known reference samples and put all that into proper reports and testify if necessary. So this was lab work with the state police, is that correct? That's correct. Now how long were you at the Indiana State Police? I was there for four years from May of 2003 until May of 2007. What did you do then? <laughs> I then was uh, interested in going home uh, and I had a position waiting for me there where I could work uh, as a technical manager uh, for a startup lab uh, that would do outsource uh, DNA that could be for uh, um, to help reduce uh, crime lab backlogs or to do defense testing. Uh, so I came home to Las Cruces, New Mexico, where, uh, which is where New Mexico State University is. Uh, and worked there for eight months uh, as an interim a technical manager uh, before I decided to resign and start the business that I'm in right now. You still are in New Mexico, is that right? Yeah, I've been in Las Cruces since uh, 07. How long have you been employed uh, with your own business then, sir? I launched my business in February of 08, so it's been a little over 13 years. Do you exclusively provide consulting services? Yes, I, I don't do lab work. I have no lab. Uh, so that's strictly what I do is offer my consulting on all the complexities of what we do with this DNA technology and so forth. I, I would assume that there's times where your uh, expertise or your consulting needs follow-up work with another lab. Is that right? Yeah, there are some instances where there's a request for that to, to do lab, laboratory work and I have to make sure that nobody sends me anything um, because if, if there's going to be actual materials that need to be analyzed, there's various labs, uh, outsourced labs out there and there's one in the Chicago area that I particularly like, um, uh, but there are a lot of choices as to where you can get that kind of analysis done uh, in the where you have a defense uh, situation where they don't have the resources, they don't have the lab of their own. Uh, they can uh, arrange to have those materials sent to an outsourced lab and have analysis done. How many cases have you reviewed for as a case as a forensic scientist, sir? Uh, over 1,100. How many open DNA cases are you working on right now? Uh, right now about 60. In your capacity, uh, in any of the work that you have done, sir, have you ever been fired, laid off, or, or resigned for, for some cause? No. You have a website uh, for your company, is that right? Correct. That company is called? Spence Forensic Resources. Is it just a, a one-page thing, or, or what does that look like, sir? It used to be much more than that with all kinds of links and information uh, when I first started my business, but I've, I've uh, made it much simpler. Uh, it, it is just a one-page thing that describes what I do and uh, provides information as to how to contact me. Has a prosecutor ever reached out to you and asked for your services? Well, with the Indiana State Police, the first 16 times I testified and the, the, the casework I did, yes. Uh, and recently, the Indiana State Police has contacted me about a, an old analysis I did in 06, and they might be having me testify in the next couple of months. That hasn't been solidified yet, but uh, as a consultant, no. Uh, typically, it's going to be either defense attorneys, uh, public defense attorneys, or um, sometimes civil litigants. Why wouldn't a prosecutor ask you for, for your assistance on a case? Well, there, there would be a possibility of that, but they've got a built-in uh, uh, analyst when uh, a crime is going to be investigated. It's going to end up in a crime lab, much like the one that I worked at with the Indiana State Police, and they've got somebody already uh, assigned to that, and they're, they're experts. So not only do they get to do the hands-on work, uh, but they can, uh, they're trained to be able to analyze and then testify to their analysis. So there's not that much need 
to have somebody come in in a secondary fashion and review their work. What options do defense attorneys have uh, for getting a second opinion uh, on DNA evidence? Well, there's people like me available to get that from. Uh, otherwise, you've got to rely on your, your uh, biology education from college to, to um, school yourself on, on what you might need to ask uh, crime lab analysts. So what we've asked you to do is to take a look at the, the DNA analysis uh, and get kind of a second opinion. Is that right? Correct. And would it make sense for us to call the crime lab analyst in Iowa to have them critique their own case? Well, it, when I was with the Indiana State Police, that just wouldn't work. If I got a call from a defense attorney, I'd, I'd be polite, but I'd tell them to talk to my technical leader if they wanted somebody to critique my case. But it doesn't make sense for me to look at my own casework and critique it. Uh, so, yeah, they would need to get somebody outside of the, the crime lab that did the work to take a look at it. So, Mr. Fries uh, and I, we, we called you and asked for your assistance in this case. Is that right? That's correct. And when a, every case is different, is that right, Dr. Spence? Yes. Uh, but generally, when a defense attorney calls you, uh, what is it that we ask you to do? Well, typically they're uh, going to be uh, interested in interpreting what's in the reports. Usually there's going to be either one short report, or in, in this case there's four reports. Uh, they want uh, an analyst like myself to look at all those reports, but to go beyond that and also look at all what are called the uh, supporting documents. And I mentioned those steps of uh, uh, laying out the case items and looking for body fluids and uh, extracting DNA, quantifying DNA and doing all the typing, uh, an analyst like myself, we can look at all those supporting documents just to make sure that everything adds up and makes sense. And there's police reports to look at as well to tie together with the scientific work. Uh, so that's typically what I'm being asked to do is to tie everything together and to make, uh, make sure that the science makes sense. So there's checks and balances in place, is that right, sir? Yes, so within the crime lab you have peer review, for example, you have another analyst who did not handle the case who will peer review the reports and the supporting documents, but I'm doing an added layer of that. When I examine a case, I'm looking at it again as a peer reviewer uh, of all the documents. Now, your job, uh, Spence Forensic Services, uh, you don't do it just out of the goodness of your heart, is that right? Sometimes, but, but most of my cases I'm going to uh, charge fees. Uh, your your company is how you support your family, is that right? That's correct. Are you being paid uh, to conduct uh, work for Mr. Fries and I as well as to testify? Yes, ma'am. How do you keep up with emerging technologies uh, when you're not at a lab? Uh, well, probably the best way that I can do that is uh, what I'm doing is looking at so many cases out of uh, so many labs in so many states. Uh, I'm not only just looking at the reports and the supporting documents and all the police reports, but I do look at their standard operating procedures and of the various labs. Uh, there are DNA technical manuals that describe precisely how they do things, so I can keep up on the evolution of that in various labs and look at that. But there's also uh, in the age of the internet, all the scientific papers uh, that are published uh, relevant to forensic biology and DNA, you can usually get those for, uh, for free. Uh, one example is uh, a service called ResearchGate that I use more than anything else to find these uh, articles and get a hold of them, sometimes directly from the authors. But there's, especially during the pandemic, uh, with a lot of downtime from uh, court, there's a lot of webinars that are available that you can either attend uh, um, over the internet uh, and, and see what's going on with uh, a lot of talks that people are giving on forensic biology and DNA, but you can review archived webinars on that. So I, I do a lot of that, and I, I think that that pretty much covers it to have all those resources available to keep up with the emerging technology. How many different laboratories have you reviewed DNA evidence from? I think it's over 90 at this point. What about how many different jurisdictions or states? Uh, that's out of 30 different states. As part of your work, 
how many times have you been qualified to testify as a DNA expert witness? Uh, the first uh, 16 times were with the Indiana State Police uh, as a representative of, of that uh, facility where I worked uh, for the prosecution. I've also testified another 129 times. Uh, so this is the 146th time uh, either in a hearing or a uh, trial. Through your 16 or 17 years of working as a forensic scientist, have you ever been disallowed to testify as to your expert opinion? On forensic biology and DNA, uh, not once. Have you been qualified to testify in specialized forensic DNA areas? Uh, yes, on uh, things such as just the crime scene handling of DNA uh, items, potential DNA items, uh, DNA mixture analysis, uh, there's uh, transfer events that can uh, play into how a case is analyzed. Uh, and minimizing uh, contamination within the laboratory. I've testified to all those areas. There's another technology called uh, YSTR testing, which is male-based uh, DNA testing, and I've testified to all those specialized sub-areas uh, which would fall under forensic biology and DNA. Are there ever any times that a defense attorney has called you and asked for your assistance and you haven't been able to help them? Yeah, well, there's been instances where I could at least help them to understand what's in the, the case file, uh, and I'm always able to do that, but there, there are many instances where uh, there's nothing wrong with the way the work was done. There are no problems or interpretation issues, uh, and just as a gauge, uh, uh, it's less than 15% of the time that I have a case where I'm actually needed to testify. So it's much more common for you to find no major problems, is that right? That's correct. Your Honor, I'd ask this court to qualify Dr. Spence as an expert witness in DNA. Mr. Brown. Judge, I don't believe it's necessary to have the court do that. Um, we have very liberal rules on experts. Uh, we have no uh, dispute that he is an expert in DNA analysis. Your request is granted. When were you first contacted to look at Christian Bahena Rivera's case? Uh, that would be uh, the very early uh, beginning of October of 2019. What did you review in looking at his case? I reviewed, as I mentioned, there's case reports involved in this instance. There were uh, four of them. Uh, most of those were uh, generated in 2018. Uh, shortly after the, the, the incident in question and uh, into the latter part of 2018 and then another report came out uh, right around the beginning of October of 2019. So I review all those reports and tied to those uh, 26 items that were looked in, at in those reports are all the supporting documents that I mentioned, all those steps that we do in the crime lab. I looked at uh, all the documentation from that, various police reports, photographs, uh, that sort of thing. Now, when DNA uh, evidence is submitted, uh, how do you, I, I guess, find a match or, or, you know, compare it with someone's known DNA? Well, within these reports, uh, uh, there, as I mentioned, supporting documents, probably the key documents within there are something called electropherograms. I'll call them egrams to make it easier on everybody. Um, that These egrams are just the actual data output from each of the evidence items. I mentioned there's 26 uh, evidence items, but you also have references from, a, a, in this case, a couple of known individuals, and you can do comparisons uh, of what's on the egrams from those uh, and deduce, uh, for example, when there's mixtures of DNA, whether a person's DNA is within that mixture or not. In this case, what known DNA samples were submitted, sir? There, there were only two that were used for those comparative purposes, and those would be the victim, Ms. Tibbetts, uh, and the defendant, uh, Mr. Baena. 
there were some other samples that I, I were submitted uh, when Ms. Tibbetts was, was still missing uh, to try to develop a DNA profile. Is that right? That's correct. And, and explain that just briefly for the jury. Well, in some instances uh, where we have uh, a body that's been found, there might be difficulties in getting a good DNA profile from that person or verifying that that that, that is the right person. So you can take family members and do comparison comparisons to family members to con confirm that they're related uh, and that you're not misidentifying anybody or you're not getting any of the genetic information wrong. Uh, and that was done in this case, and I see that often, especially with homicide cases. When it comes to examining the results uh, within Iowa DCI reports and checking their conclusions against all supporting documents, isn't it true that one thing that you are looking for is, is problems? Yes. And in this case, did you find any problems with the, the, uh, the analyzing of the evidence? No, just based on what the typical uh, protocols are for doing all those steps of extraction and quantifying the DNA and doing the comparisons, I didn't see any uh, major issues with uh, handling uh, or possible risks of contamination uh, or protocols that were in place that weren't followed properly. I didn't see those kind of problems in this case. So all the, po the proper protocols were followed, uh, no, no issues there, is that right? Yeah, it was typical of, of most cases uh, how the analysis was set up and done. It was, uh, there were no surprises there. There were no major problems, uh, but when you refer to interpretation, uh, first of all, what does interpretation mean for the, the jury? Well, typically that's going to be the interpretation of what's on those egrams when you do uh, uh, an analysis of, for example, DNA mixtures that come off of some uh, evidence items. You want to compare those. In this case, we have the, just the two samples, from one from the victim and one from the defendant. Uh, sometimes there can be interpretation issues, especially with mixtures, uh, and there, there can be some disagreement in exactly how you interpret what's on various items in any case, and I did see some differences in how I would characterize the mixtures. So the difference of uh, opinion would be the interpretation issues of the DNA evidence, is that right? That's correct. And what did you see there, sir? I saw on, on various items, just generally speaking, uh, that there were mixtures uh, that, that could be seen. In some cases, the mixtures were uh, fairly strong profiles, but in, in some instances, they were, they were weaker profiles. Uh, but generally, with a lot of labs within their guidelines, what they, they do is they, uh, they uh, get mixtures that are somewhat complex and weak signals, and they just refer to the, those result comparisons as inconclusive. And in some instances, I wouldn't necessarily call them inconclusive. In this case, uh, well, first of all, you know, Ms. Tibbetts, uh, we know, is, is a victim of a crime here. You'd uh, agree with that. Is that right? Yeah, that's clear. Uh, and Mr. Uh, Bahena Rivera has been charged, uh, so it makes sense that his uh, buckle swab has been submitted. Is that right? Correct. So in, in reference to, to Ms. Tibbetts and Mr. Bahena Rivera, what are we looking for just with them? Well, in, in any case, it's similar to this, where you just, it's simplified. It's just uh, looking at a defendant and just looking at a victim. You're going to typically look at things that are uh, possessions of the defendant, for example, his vehicle is, is key in this case, or, or any kind of possessions that would be from any defendant, things like his clothing or his personal items. You're going to uh, not necessarily be interested in his DNA on his own items. You're looking for foreign DNA, specifically a victim of a crime. You want to look uh, within a car for that victim or any other items from him. Conversely, if you have uh, the if you're taking samples from the actual person who's been victimized or that person's clothing, you're not necessarily very interested in their profile there. You're looking for foreign profiles, uh, specifically if you see evidence of the defendant there on uh, on a victim on her or on her clothing. You want you want to be able to characterize that and identify that presence. Now. If, and I'm talking about in a hypothetical, we see unaccounted for DNA, does that 100% mean that somebody else was involved in a crime? 
It, it could mean that, but the DNA is not going to tell you that. The DNA is going to only tell you from a specific evidence item whether or not there are those unaccounted for sources of DNA or a source of DNA. It's only going to tell you that, that they're there within what, what is a snapshot of what's on that surface. It's not going to tell you the history of how that DNA got there. There's no time stamp that tells you when it came to be there. But it can tell us if there's an out-of-place individual somewhere near a location of a crime scene that perhaps might have been involved. Is that correct? Yes, that could be what you're looking at when you see unaccounted for alleles on a, an item that is in a location like that. Now, sir, I'm going to direct you your attention to the, the examination of the trunk liner in this case. Uh, and I'd ask counsel, uh, State's Exhibit 50 has already been admitted. I'd, I'd ask counsel to bring that up and to bring it up on the screen. We'll get that here in just a second. We've got it, Scott. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I won't make you do my work for me. That's okay. We can Yet. All right, now, sir, uh, it, with reference to the trunk liner, uh, which was covered uh, in item number 58 that was submitted to the lab, do you have some interpretation differences? Yes, uh, 58, uh, item, the area 58, I'll call it, can be broken down into uh, various sub items. Uh, most key is uh, 58.1, 58.2, 58.3 and 58.4. Um, I'm not sure which is which on here, but those were all what were considered possible blood stains. And when a presumptive test for blood was run, uh, those tested positive, those four areas. And what did you find that you disagree as a matter of interpretation, sir? Uh, well, in the instance of, for example, 58.1, there were 17 unaccounted for alleles. Uh, and when I just to refer to what I mean by unaccounted for, we have to recall that the only two individuals we're comparing this to are the only two individuals that were typed in this case, the only two references, and those were Ms. Tibbetts uh, and the defendant. Outside of their inventory of, of genetic markers, what, what we call alleles, were 17 unaccounted for alleles that had to be from somebody else or more than one other person. And there was a clear indication there was female DNA within there uh, that, uh, once again, we don't want to confuse that that might have been Ms. Tibbetts. We're talking about a female other than Ms. Tibbetts. So, so what it showed is that Ms. Tibbetts' uh, DNA was clearly in that, that trunk liner. Is that correct? Not on that particular place. We're not necessarily certain with, about that. In, in the instance of the laboratory interpretation, uh, 58.1 was written off as a, uh, inconclusive comparisons there. I disagreed with that to a degree, the interpretation, in that there needed to be an added statement, for example, that there were unaccounted for alleles in another source of DNA uh, that was not Ms. Tibbetts. And did it point to a uh, gender of, uh, of what that DNA con uh, contribution would be? It appeared to be a female source. Is there any other interpretation differences that you would have with uh, 58, and specifically uh, with reference to 58.1, 58.2, 58.3, 58, 58.4? Yeah, when, when you look at 58.2, there were also uh, unaccounted for alleles in that instance. It was uh, only seven of them, but there was a clear overlap between what you were seeing in the unaccounted for alleles on 58.1, where there were 17. Uh, when you get to 58.3 and 58.4, there were only four unaccounted for alleles that couldn't have been from Ms. Tibbetts, could not have been from uh, the defendant. Uh, and there was, when you get down to four alleles, it's hard to say there's overlap because it's just a few alleles. A lot of people could, could carry those. Uh, but there was some similarity uh, throughout the, the one, two, three, and four there in area 58. Let's move on to item 59. Uh, that's another fabric covered liner area from the trunk of the Black Malibu. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. And, and describe uh, any interpretation issues that you have there. With air, when we uh, talk about uh, area 59, uh, there were multiple areas that were looked at, but there were three particular areas where there was a presumptive positive 
uh, for blood. So we're not confirming blood here, but there's a clear indication that probably what you're looking at is blood. Uh, and those were uh, 58.3, 4, and 5. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying 58. See, I knew I was going to get confused. 59.3, 4, and 5. Uh, on 59.3, uh, there was a mixture, I believe that was called as a mixture of at least three individuals, with the stronger profile was clearly consistent with Ms. Tibbetts, and I agree with that 100%. But there was additional genetic information there. Uh, in one instance, it was uh, um, 10. On, I'm sorry, in 59.3, uh, it was 10 unaccounted for alleles. Uh, and so those couldn't have been from Ms. Tibbetts, could not have been from the defendant either. Uh, and that appeared to be from an unknown male. Unknown because we only have one male to compare that genetic information to. Right, so 59.3, uh, there is a DNA source that is from what you believe to be an unknown male. Is that correct? Yes, beyond the clear, uh, what we would call a major presence of Ms. Tibbetts, uh, there was those. There were those ten alleles, uh, and then also at fifty nine point four, uh, there were four additional unaccounted for alleles uh, that that showed some similarity to what was in fifty nine point three, uh, but not that clear. And then fifty nine point five, uh, that was very weak, and the laboratory called that inconclusive. And I agree, it was too inconclusive to even work with. All right. Let's move on to 60, uh, which also is, is part of the, the fabric uh, trunk liner, is that correct? That's correct. And, and what were your findings in analyzing that evidence? In, in that instance, once again, using the inventory of uh, DNA from Ms. Tibbetts, the inventory of DNA from the defendant, what unaccounted for alleles were there at 60.1 uh, added up to uh, 14 unaccounted for alleles in that uh, instance. It was a little too iffy to say whether that was male or female. They were very weak alleles, but there were a lot of them, 14. So you just know that there is another contributor that is not Ms. Tibbetts, correct? Correct. And uh, the contributor is also not Mr. Bahena Rivera, is that right? That's correct. Were there similar results from the area of the fabric liner of the door of the trunk? That's item 61.1. Yes, in, in that instance, uh, there were, once again, just looking at the inventory of the two individuals, uh, there were five unaccounted for alleles uh, in that location. So to summarize, you have no issues with how the, the procedures were followed or the, the steps were followed in analyzing the DNA evidence, is that right? Yeah, there's, there's no issues with, with how that was approached. And I forgot, forgot to mention, too, on 61.1, it was uh, impossible to tell whether those unaccounted for alleles were from a male or a female. But when it comes to the details of specific interpretations of e-grams from various items, specifically 58, 59, 60, and 61, you believe that the DCI oversimplified things a bit? Do yes. Do object to please leaving at this point? Sustain. Please rephrase. When it comes to the details of specific interpretations, and specifically with reference to 58, 59, 60, and 61, what is your interpretation, sir? I would say that it's typical of a lot of laboratories that they are going to be very oversimplified uh, in interpreting mixtures like that, and a lot of times they're going to be just uh, written off as uh, 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 uninterpretable or not suitable for comparison. Uh, and to some degree, I agree with that, but I disagree that there aren't unaccounted for alleles that could not be uh, tied to um, either the defendant or Ms. Tibbetts, that there, there are other contributors there. And you can even, in some instances, as I pointed out, you could deduce that they were likely from a female in one instance in one area of 58. Uh, and then there was male DNA in, in another area that was unaccounted for. Uh, and then a few other areas where there were just a, a few added alleles in there. And it was difficult to say whether what the gender was of, of those people, except that they were not Ms. Tibbetts and they were not the defendant. If a known DNA sample were provided to the lab, could that be compared to see if there were similarities with the samples? 
Yes, you can always do a comparison. Uh, you could take my DNA and compare it to them. Now, you, in some instances where the DNA um, signals that are there are, are very weak, the comparisons are only useful for what we call exclusionary purposes. You could at least exclude that that person is that added contributor. But in some instances where we're up to 17 unaccounted for alleles or 14 unaccounted for alleles, you could potentially do an inclusion of a person if either most or all of those signals do match them. And you could do a statistical calculation um, that can uh, give weight to that inclusion. But for exclusionary purposes, that's often what we're looking for when we get down to uh, minor alleles within a mixture. No further questions. Thank you. Mr. Brown, you may cross-examine. Hang on just one second, Judge. Dr. Spence, good morning. Good morning. I don't think we've ever met before other than just prior to the courtroom. Would that be true? I, I think so. Okay, that's all right. Um, just to make sure I have this understood with regard to what, what you do, um, you, you don't have a laboratory of your own, is that correct? I do not. Uh, if you wanted to um, have any item tested in this case, you would have to submit it to an outside lab like the one you um, named in Chicago that you utilize. Is that correct? Yeah. To, to better characterize that, I would recommend that lab or recommend various other labs that are located in other places. Uh, and that those items would have to be secured from whoever has them in their possession right. and sent directly to those outsources. All right. Very good. And you don't do your own testing? No, I do not. Um, and the, the only expert, or I'm sorry, the only background that you have with any state crime lab, like what Ms. Scott, uh, who, who she works for, was in Indiana for about four years? Yeah, Is that was, true? It was four years with Indiana State Police. Okay. So you are aware from reviewing all of the laboratory material that um, samples were retained for further testing if needed. Is that true? That's correct. And that is uh, sticking with DCI laboratory protocols. Would that be true? But yeah, that's similar to the protocols we had with the Indiana State Police is to avoid consumption of, of items. All right. So, and that's so it can be retested, correct? Yes. Either to confirm or disconfirm uh, what the, the criminalist would have done at the state laboratory here in Iowa. Is that right? That's the idea, yes. Okay. Uh, did you uh, request that any of the items that you reviewed in the report be resubmitted to an outside laboratory uh, for any type of testing? No, I typically don't recommend doing outsource testing or recommend against it. Uh, if that uh, issue comes up, uh, that's where I point out that there are labs that I favor over other labs as being a, a better laboratory resource for that. I understand, but you were mentioning with Ms. Freeze uh, earlier in your testimony, these other items that you were interpreting beyond what Ms. Scott interpreted, correct? Yeah, when we talk about, uh, there are items that were interpreted by the Iowa DCI, but the interpretations were just a little bit oversimplified and uh, as being uh, inconclusive results. And would you expect that if you resubmitted those items to an outside laboratory, the same results would um, have occurred? Uh, well, I think that th there would be uh, if you're talking about comparison just to the two individuals, I think you probably, you would at least expect the same results, but you, you can never be sure. What the key is, is that are there other individuals there? Well, there are. Uh, we'd have to take reference samples and make comparisons to those. You have any issue at all with the state crime lab uh, that they followed their own protocols in this case and uh, interpreting what was found in the trunk of the Black Malibu? No, I have no issues with the way that they, uh, that they did their protocols. And as for their interpretations, I've been pretty clear about how I might interpretate things, uh, interpret, and interpret things a little bit different than the way they did. It's kind of a tough word sometimes, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, so it's, it's your opinion that you would interpret things just a bit differently than Ms. Scott? 
That's where yeah, we're at. In that there's unaccounted for alleles there, and that's that's clear that there are. And would it be fair to say that Ms. Scott's uh, interpretations are fairly conservative when it comes to identifying uh, any person, any person's DNA in the trunk? Yeah, I think, and that's typical of a lot of laboratories, that they're going to be a little bit noncommittal when there are weak added profiles that are present within there. And certainly your interpretation would be subject to disagreement, is that correct? That is always the case. Okay. We were to ask another criminalist that has DNA expertise, they might disagree with what you're saying here today? They would be free to do so if they felt that that was correct. Uh, that your interpretations are a little bit more liberal than uh, the interpretations of the DCI crime lab, would that be true? I would say that comparing them side by side, it's more liberal to say that they were unaccounted for alleles, but there clearly were. So I find it hard to believe that they'd disagree with at least that conclusion that there's added sources there that, uh, uh, that they didn't go into in making comparisons because there were only the two references to work with. Okay. Um, you're, uh, I'm assuming that you are aware of a blood stain that was found on a, the trunk seal of the uh, black Chevy Malibu. Are you aware of that? Yes, I am. Uh, and you're aware that that particular blood stain uh, was compared to the known DNA of Molly Tibbetts? Yes, that's correct. And the testimony has been that that DNA the, that was developed from that blood stain was a match to the known DNA of Molly Tibbetts. Do you disagree with that? Oh, I do not disagree with that. I, I agree fully with that. And on that blood stain, on that trunk liner that is Molly Tibbetts' blood, there was no mixture, correct? Uh, no, there was a, a single source in that instance, yes. Right, and uh, Ms. Scott testified to the exact same phrasing, a single source of DNA that you just used. Were you aware of that? I wasn't aware of what she testified to, but it was in her report. Okay. Uh, so what is a single source uh, DNA profile? Explain that to the jury, please. Well, just for example, if I were to, to have a little accident and stab my finger and leave a drop of blood there, especially if this was, a com uh, with the pandemic, a completely cleaned off area right here, and they just took a little bit of that blood, I'd be shocked if it wasn't an absolute single source of just me. Uh, so when you have that kind of instance of a very rich source of DNA like blood, uh, that's what you would expect. And if you have no unaccounted for alleles in that sample of the little drop I left there, you would call that a single source. All right. And that single source uh, DNA profile that is Molly Tibbetts' blood would give us strong evidence. Would you agree that Molly Tibbetts was on or in the trunk of a black Malibu? Well, I think that to be more simple about it, that that did, was a presumptive test for blood. There's every reason to believe it was blood. It, it was a, gave a strong profile, like blood would. It was a single source. How it got there, the DNA can't tell you that, only that it's there and it's clearly her DNA. There's there's no doubt that it might be somebody else. It's not. I understand. We have to look at all the evidence in the case to make that determination. Would you agree? I would agree. I mean, you're just one part of that, like Miss Scott is one part of the case. Would that be true? Precisely. Uh, but the blood certainly associates an injured Molly Tibbetts with the black <laughs> Malibu. Would that be true? I think that that's a reasonable assumption, yes. All right. And the, the mixture uh, that's inside the trunk also has uh, the known DNA of Molly Tibbetts. Is that correct? But in the one case that was 59.3, yes, I fully agree that that... Uh, um, what we call a major profile in that mixture was consistent with uh, Molly Tibbetts and the statistics on that were it was a big number and I have no disagreement with that. Right. And that that certainly that blood would associate Molly Tibbetts uh, with the trunk of the Ma of the black Malibu is that correct? Yes presuming that that's blood and I think that that's a reasonable presumption uh, there's no doubt that that was uh, from her and could have been from an injury uh, sustained to, to the woman. All right. And um, it would associate Molly Tibbetts presence inside the trunk of the black Chevy Malibu is that correct I think that, that there's potential for that yes and again the fact that Molly's blood is inside the trunk would indicate to you or any other expert looking at this, that she was injured while she was uh, in the trunk. Would that be true? 
I think that that would be very plausible, very reasonable, uh, logical assumption. Concerning your interpretation of the presence of other DNA, um, you have no idea how that other DNA may have been transferred into the trunk. Is that true? That's correct. The DNA is uh, amazing, amazing technology, remarkable technology, and uh, very sensitive. But it's never going to give you uh, an answer to the question of the history of how something came to be there, or the timing of it. Right, and I and we. You might look at other factors and other uh, evidence in a case to draw that conclusion, correct? Yes, uh, this is where a lot of other factors uh, can be considered to try and determine who that is. Okay, and you might look at uh, statements that the driver of the Black Malibu made in helping to make that kind of determination. Would that be true? I think that that would be pertinent uh, information to consider, yes. Okay, and um, you might look at what other witnesses may have said in the case or testified to concerning how or when a person might have been associated with a vehicle. Would that be true? Yeah, I think that in all cases, uh, whether they're uh, sexual related cases or homicides or robberies, you do want to consider what witnesses say. All right. Now the other uh, profile that you're uh, testifying to with regard to interpretation, one of those was female, correct? That's correct. Uh, that could be Molly Tibbetts' DNA. Would that be true? Uh, in the instance of the areas on 59, I'm sorry, 58, area 58, no. They, they were unaccounted for alleles that uh, were not consistent with uh, Ms. Tibbetts or the defendant. Okay, so it was, you can exclude Molly Tibbetts based upon your interpretation? Uh, there, there's really no cause to believe that her DNA is, is in that particular that, area, 58.1. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Would that mean another female had been in the trunk? Oh, the, there's no way of knowing if that means somebody was in the trunk. It just means the DNA is on that surface that was tested. And I have to remind everyone that what we're looking at is a snapshot of what came off on a, a swabbing or a cutting from material. So it could have been transferred in there by another item that had been placed in the trunk at some point in time? Yeah, it could be direct contact from a person. It could be a transfer event. It could be someone in the trunk. There's no way of knowing with, uh, how that came to be there. The and DNA the doesn't answer that question for us. And the same would be true with regard to what you've identified and interpreted as another male DNA in the trunk. Would that be true? That's correct. It's the same answers for those. And again, drawing your conclusions about this case uh, beyond DNA, you have to look at all the evidence in the case. Would that be a uh, fair thing to I do? Think Yes, for all the cases I've worked on, you want to look at everything. So all of it, collectively, all the witnesses, all the information, and in drawing any conclusion as to what any type of DNA profile uh, was in the trunk, what that might mean. Would that be true? Look at everything. That's correct. I'm, I'm here for the science, but uh, absolutely there's a lot of other factors that you want to look at in any case. Sorry, just a second. So would it be fair to say uh, that your role here is to solely look at the DNA analysis that was done in this case and offer your opinion with regard to that? Yes, I would say the forensic biology and DNA, how the analysis was done, and uh, you know whether protocols were followed and that sort of thing. Yes. All right. Um, Dr. Spence. Let me ask you this, if there was an item in the trunk uh, that blood transferred to that could be removed, um, could that exclude or include anything in the trunk that may have been touched by that, that item? Do you understand what I'm asking? 
Not really. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll try again. So if there was an item in the trunk that blood transferred to that could be removed, the defendant could remove that, correct? Uh, yes, if you're talking about, let's just say, um, a rag in the trunk. Uh, if that if that was re, uh, if there was blood on that rag, that's something that can we, we all know intuitively that the rag could be removed. And if there are items in the trunk that were removed, those wouldn't be there for criminalists or investigators to see later. Is that correct? Yeah, and that's just a, a logical question. If it's not there, then you can't analyze it. And lastly, Dr. Spence, the, would you agree that heat and elements uh, degrade DNA? Uh, heat is, uh, uh, the DNA is very resistant to heat. It can be, uh, but it's, it's best not for it to be exposed to heat. Moisture can be bad. Sunlight can be bad for DNA. Uh, and just a, a, a lot of things can erode uh, rub off or or dilute DNA. All right, um, and you're aware of the fact that uh, Molly Tibbetts was found in a cornfield in rural Powsheet County on uh, August 21st of 2018. Are you aware of that? Yes, I am. Uh, and it would appear that her body had been there for uh, several weeks. Would that be true? That's correct. All right, and that type of decomposition that would have occurred in this case would certainly degrade DNA, is that right? It's going to have a tendency to degrade DNA to be out in the environment exposed to, in that fashion to remove all the DNA, not likely, but it's not going to be um, very helpful for recovery of DNA. Have you ever been in a cornfield in, in the middle of July after a rainstorm? Probably have been. That's, right. that's an Indiana thing there. I lived right next to one, so... It can be fairly humid, correct? Oh, yeah. Uh, and wet. Yes. And all of those things affect um, the ability to get any type of identifiable DNA from a body. Is that correct? That's correct. Dr. Spence, thank you very much. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Ms. Fries, do you have redirect? Uh, just briefly. Sir, let's talk first about the single source uh, DNA profile from Molly Tibbetts' blood on the, the bumper of the, the vehicle. You recall talking about that, is that right? Yes. And so for that, only Molly Tibbetts' blood was found there, is that correct? That's correct. And so there weren't any other sources to compare to or, or anything like that. Is that correct? That's correct. It was with it being a single source, there aren't any unaccounted for alleles. Now focusing then to items 59 and 60, those are both inside of the trunk. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. That's my understanding as to how those were located. And I want to focus to 59.3. Uh, that's a cutting that was taken from the fabric liner. Is that right? That's correct. And your findings were that one of the profiles was uh, Molly Tibbetts. Is that correct? Yes. But you also found that there were two other uh, uh, DNA profiles that were included. Is that right? There did appear to be more than one other source, and there were 10 unaccounted for alleles. The strongest source, were you able to give any sort of opinion as to w whether those came from a male or a female? Those did appear to be from a male with uh, Miss Tibbetts not being a male. Then when you see uh, a, a, a hint on the electropharogram of a Y chromosome, that's a clear indication that there's at least a, a male contributor in there. Now, we have Mr. Bahena Rivera's sample to uh, compare, is that correct? That's correct. 
did you uh, suggest to, to Mr. Fries or I that, that we seek the, the help of an outside lab? I can't recall if I did or not. When you're up to 60 um, cases that are unresolved, it's uh, difficult to recall things like that. Would a lab be of any assistance if we had no other samples to run against, uh, specifically item 59.3? No, you'd have to work only with the known profiles that we have from Ms. Tibbetts and, uh, and the defendant. We, we already had that. Uh, so, no, it wouldn't be useful unless we had another reference sample or more than one other reference sample to do comparisons. So if we had a buckle sample from a, another known suspect, you could submit that and, and see if there is a match. Is that correct? Yes, with so little genetic information there. Uh, it's, I wouldn't use the word match, but you can show if there's consistencies there. Or as I said, for exclusionary purposes, 10 alleles would work uh, very well. So with reference to 59.3, if we had a known buckle uh, sample, you could submit that and at least exclude uh, possibly. Is that correct? Yes, you, you could show some consistencies or you could exclude depending on how the results line up. What about item 60.1? That's another item that there was a mixture of, of DNA found. Is that right? Yes, and in that instance, there were 14 unaccounted for alleles. And if we had another known buckle swab uh, of a potential suspect, uh, would that be of use in comparison? Yeah, if you had a, a known reference from anybody, you could do that same comparison uh, and show some level of inclusion or exclude that person. No further questions. Mr. Brown, any recross? Just a few questions, Judge. Um, you would agree that the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation uh, did not break their interpretation guidelines. Would that be true? I don't believe so, no. Okay. And is it safe to say, uh, Dr. Spence, that you would expect uh, another person's DNA in the trunk of a well-used car? It'd be hard to say for certain. It wouldn't be a surprise to find other sources of DNA and various surfaces of a vehicle. And are you aware uh, as to the protocols that the DCI crime lab follows in making their comparisons in uh, DNA analysis? I wouldn't say I'm fluent in that, but that I've looked at so many uh, guidelines from so many different laboratories. I saw nothing unusual uh, about how their guidelines were set up. So there were, was no real surprise in, uh, in some instances calling mixtures uh, uninterpretable. Right. And so it's no surprise to you and certainly within the realm of the expertise of the DNA anal analysts at the crime lab that they will not compare a sample if it is too weak or too complex. Sometimes they will. Uh, and surprise me that they do, and sometimes they won't, and uh, it surprises me that, that they didn't do a comparison. In this instance, they only had the two references, so with unaccounted for alleles, uh, they wrote those off as uninterpretable, uh, and th th that's not so unusual to see that. Okay. Um, and DNA, blood, items that where you can develop a profile, you cannot place a time as to when that particular DNA was placed in that particular location. Would that be true? That's correct. DNA doesn't come with a timestamp. And again, you have to look at other evidence in the case to uh, make those determinations. Would you agree with that? Yeah, to at least get an idea, a hint as to what the timing might be. All right. uh, you have no dispute that Molly Tibbetts' blood and DNA was on the trunk seal of the black Chevy Malibu that's at issue in this case? No, I don't dispute that at all. And you also don't dispute that Molly Tibbetts' blood and DNA was inside the trunk of the black Chevy Malibu, Malibu that's uh, the, one of the subjects of this case. Would that be true? Yes, we're talking about item 59.3, uh, and that is an interior area, uh, and it's a mixture that that uh, partial profile, it's a near complete profile, was consistent with Ms. Tibbetts and the statistics on that, I have no dispute with how those were calculated. So Molly Tibbetts' blood is inside the trunk? Apparently, yes. All right, that's all, thank you. Ms. Fries, are we done with this witness? Yes. Okay. Sir, thank you for being here, you're excused. Thank you.
Members of the jury, at this time, we'll take a 10-minute recess. I want to remind you of your admonition. Leave your notebooks where they are, and you uh, may exit at this time. Thank you.
in the presence of the uh, jury, the uh, Mr. Behemoth is present along with the attorneys of record, and at this time the defense may call their next witness. Defense calls Alejandra Cervantes. Uh, actually, let's stop here and I'll swear you in. Raise your right hand, please. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes. Okay. Now, you make your way over to the chair, please. Have Ms. Freeze. Please state your full name. Alejandra Cervantes Valle. Alejandra Cervantes Valle. Where do you live? Vivo en Toledo, Iowa. I live in Toledo, Iowa. Who do you live there with? Con quien vive ahí? Con mi esposo y mis hijos. With my husband and my children. Your husband's name is what? Su esposo, ¿cuál es? Delfino Valle. Delfino Valle. Are you related by marriage to Christian Bahena Rivera? Yes. How are you related to Christian Bahena Rivera? Because he's my husband's nephew. So Delfino's nephew, is that right? Yes. Now, yes. Ma'am, you do speak a little bit of English, is that right? Yes. Uh, you've kind of been a, a spokesperson for the, the family with this. Yes. If a meeting is needed, I, I normally contact you. Yes. Uh, and so you do speak some English, is that right? Yes. What is your primary language? Spanish. Spanish. Were you born in the United States? No. No. Where were you born? In Mexico. In Mexico. How is it that you ended up in Tama, Iowa? Mi papá nos aplicó para una visa. Well, my father applied for a visa uh, for us, and we qualified, so we all came here. So your entire family came to the United States together? Yes. And that was under lawful means? Yes. When did you come to the United States? Interpreted, what's the clarify? 2003. 2003. How old were you? 17 years old. Where did you come? Uh, Marshalltown, Iowa. And since then, has the Marshalltown, Tama area been your home? Yes. How did you meet Delfino? We both worked together. Where did you work together? Well, at a company that was named JBS. What did you do for JBS? Labor. Labor. What type of a company is JBS? It is a meat packing processing plant. So you and your husband uh, both worked there, is that right? Yes. Do you work outside of the home? At this moment? Right. Correct. Yes. Where do you work? I work at a place that is called Pilgrim Heights. What do you do for Pilgrim Heights? Uh, 
Cleaning. You, your husband, is he employed? Yes. And where is he employed at, ma'am? On JBS. At JBS. When approximately did you first meet Christian Bahena Rivera? Uh, four, five, six, uh, seven years. And is that the time that Christian Bahena Rivera came to the central Iowa area? Yes. How did you find out that he was coming? No recuerdo bien cómo fue. Well, I don't remember well how it went. Lo único que supe fue que um, él ya estaba aquí. Uh, the, the only thing I knew is that he was already here. Did Christian Bahena Rivera come by lawful means? No. No. How does someone get from Mexico to Iowa? Eso es lo que yo sé. Well, this is what I know. Yo no tengo esa experiencia. I don't have that type of experience. Pero sé que caminan y cruzan la frontera. But what I know is that they walk and they cross the border. ¿Cómo? No lo sé. Yo no, yo no lo viví. How? I, I really don't know. I did not live through that. What is a, uh, is it a bueno. coyote? Es un coyote? Sí. Yes. What is that, ma'am? ¿Qué es eso? Una persona que tiene contactos, me imagino. Well, it's a person that I imagine has contacts. Y puede cruzar a las personas. And can bring people across the border. Now, when bueno. Christian Bahena bueno. Rivera uh, came across the border, did he utilize a coyote? No estoy segura. I'm not sure. Did the family have to produce money uh, to get Christian Bahena Rivera? Sí. Yes. And, and tell me what you remember from that. Lo único que recuerdo fue que dijeron que él estaba aquí que necesitaba dinero. No recuerdo cuál fue la cantidad, pero que necesitaba dinero para que el coyote lo dejara estar aquí en los Estados Unidos. Uh, well, all I remember is that they said, uh, well, that they said that, uh, that they needed money. I, I really don't remember how much, but they, didn't, they needed money for the coyote to let him stay here in the United States. And did the family work together to get that money? Oh, yeah. Now, Christian's parents are, are back in Mexico, is that right? Ah, uh, yes, they've always been there. His father's name is what? Eduardo. Eduardo. And El Eduardo has brothers in Iowa, including Delfino. Is that right? Yes. I'd ask the court attendant to bring up uh, defendant's exhibit Q Q Q. And there's a screen in front of you, ma'am. Go ahead and take a look at it. Uh huh. Yes. This is a, a picture that includes uh, my client. Is that right? Yes. Your husband is also in that picture. Is that right? Yes. And are his uh, other brothers, uh, Christian uh, uncles, also in that picture? Yes. Where is the picture at? It was at my sister-in-law's wedding. I'd offer defendants exhibit Q, Q, Q. Mr. Brown. Judge, can I voir dire the witness on uh, the date? You may. Ms. Cervantes, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Concerning the photo that you have on the screen, can you tell us when that photo would have been taken? 
Fue en el 2016. It was in 2016. And it was at a wedding? Yes. Judge, our objection would be to relevance based upon the timing of the photo. Um, it's also improper character evidence. So that's the uh, basis of our objection. Ms. Fries, uh, given the answer of the witness that this photo is from 2016, uh, I'm going to sustain the objection on that basis. So QQQ will not be admitted into evidence. Ma'am, are you close with Christian Vajena Rivera? Yes. Before this happened, how often would you see him? Every week. What about the family, uh, your husband's other brothers? Are you close with them? Yes. Do you all regularly spend time with each other? Yes. Do you have birthday parties? Yes. Fam family celebrations? Yes. When you have those parties, uh, is it normally only Hispanic people that attend? Yes. Is that because you have any bias or, or anything towards white people? No. No. Why do you think it is that you spend time mostly with Hispanics? Well, because uh, the people that gather together is only uh, the family. Now, Christian Bahena Rivera, you had never met him uh, prior to him coming to the United States, is that right? No, I have not. Uh, but once he came, uh, you embraced him as part of the family, is that correct? Yes. Why? Uh, well, because, well, because he was my husband's nephew. Did anyone in your family uh, take Christian in to, to live with them? Yes. Who? Uh, Luis Medina. Luis Medina. And how is Luis related to the family? He is my sister-in-law's husband. Since uh, Christian Bahena Rivera has been in this country, has he been employed? Yes. Where has he worked? Uh, well, I knew that he worked at a, well, we call it uh, the dairy. So he worked at the dairy for a while, is that right? Yes. And was that in Brooklyn, or was that a previous job? Well, what I knew about was from Brooklyn. How often would Christian Bahena Rivera work? All week. Would his work take him every day? Yes. Describe Christian Bahena Rivera's, uh, how he is when he's with family. Before she answers that, Judge, I'm going to object as uh, improper character evidence on the specific instances of conduct. Overruled. Witness may answer. Alejandra, I'm going to re-ask the question. Uh, describe Christian Bahena Rivera's uh, demeanor or how he is around family. Well, with the family, he's uh, very funny. He always uh, is uh, playing with the family. Uh-huh. If he is with people that he does not know, have you seen him? 
Yes. Describe his behavior then. Uh, he's very shy. He's shy. He's quiet. So once people get to know him, he's more outgoing. Is that right? Uh, yes, when he uh, has come, when he feels comfortable with the people, yes. You understand that Christian Bahena Rivera has been charged with the murder of Molly Tibbetts, is that right? Yes. Now, when this woman uh, went missing, did you see uh, information about it on the news? Yes. Uh, it was a compelling story. Yes. How did you become aware that Christian Bahena Rivera uh, had been sought by law enforcement? Supe una vez que lo pararon para hacerle preguntas a supuestamente él había dicho que era rutina. Uh, well, I found out once uh, that he had been stopped to be asked questions, use uh, routine questions. ¿Y la segunda vez? Oh. And the second time? Fue cuando ya nos habló mi cuñada que estaba en la, en la estación de policía de Montezuma. And it was when my sister-in-law uh, called us and let us know that he was at the Montezuma Police Department. So you find out that he's being brought in for questioning, is that right? Yes. As time goes on, do you become concerned uh, for his welfare? Yes. Did you go to the police department? Yes. The police department, you said, is in Montezuma, is that right? Yes. What time did you arrive? Yo llegué como a las ocho y media. I arrived there at like 8.30. When you arrived there, was there anyone else in your family that was there? Sí, mi cuñado. Yes, my brother-in-law. What is his name? ¿Y cómo se llama él? Luis Medina. Luis Medina. When you arrived there, were you even admitted inside of the building? No, hay un pequeño, um, ¿qué se puede decir? Como un, un pequeño porch donde tú entras. Uh, no, when you get there, there's a small, I guess you could call it like a small porch that you go into when you get there. And if, if you go further inside a, a locked door, there's a waiting room with chairs. Is that right? Yes. So similar to uh, any waiting room in a doctor's office or a sheriff's office or, or a jail that you would wait for someone to come and get you, is that right? Yes. Were you allowed admission into that, that waiting room where there were chairs? No. No. So you stayed in the, the kind of porch area is what you're saying? Yes. How long, approximately, were you at the sheriff's office? I arrived there, uh, I was there from 8.30 until 1.30 in the morning. When you were there, were there officers and did it appear there were things going on? Yes. Did you attempt through any means to try to talk with an officer? Uh, when they went by and I saw them, yes. Did they help you? No. No. Were they able, to, did you ask them any questions or anything like that? No. No. Now, ma'am, at 
Well, let me back up. Uh, you have Christian Bahena Rivera's phone number, is that right? Yes. Would it be unusual for him to call you? No. No. Would it be unusual for him to text you? No. No. Uh, he's a, a young man, correct? Yes. Would he rely on you if he needed uh, errands done or some help with things? Like, what are errands? It, would he rely on you if he needed help with something? Oh, yes. Uh, for example, previously, I think he's asked you to buy flowers uh, for him for a date. Is that right? Yes. And were you able to organize that for him? Yes. Do you remember approximately when that was that Christian Rivera or Christian Bahena Rivera had that date? No, the date just escaped me right now. Okay, sometime that yeah. summer of 2018. Yes. In any event, you and my client had fairly frequent phone contact, is that right? Yes. Did you try to contact Christian Bahena Rivera that night that he was taken into custody? Yes. How so? Uh, we called his number. Were you able to reach him? No. No. Did, how many times, approximately, did you try to reach Christian Bejena Rivera by phone or text? We, we called him several times. I don't remember the exact number. point in time did a woman come out and speak to you while you were at the sheriff's office? Yes. Describe what the woman looked like and what she was wearing. She looked young. Like me. She was wearing blue. I remember that she was wearing a strong blue. I'd ask the court attendant to bring up Defendant's Exhibit II. Ma'am, what picture is shown uh, in Defendant's Exhibit II? I see Christian in a corner and I see the woman who spoke with us. Now I'd ask counsel to bring up exhibit JJ. What's shown in those pictures, ma'am? I see Christian again in the corner and I can see that she's leaving. Your Honor, I would offer Defendant's Exhibits I.I. and J.J. at this time. Mr. Brown? No objection. Defendant's Exhibits I.I. and J.J. are admitted. Permission to publish? The woman that's in the blue in Defendant's Exhibit JJ is the woman that came and talked to you, is that right? Approximately, yes. approximately what time did she come and talk with you? Like around 10.30. When she came to talk to you, what did she say? I asked her if we needed an attorney for Christian. We had been waiting for him for several hours.
Yes, go ahead, Our Mr. Brown. Objection is based on relevance. And that this has uh, previously been addressed uh, by the court. Sustained on both grounds. Ma'am, after you talked with this woman, uh, what did you do? Ella dijo que no necesitábamos abogado. She said that we didn't need an attorney. Que no, que como en 10 o 15 minutos, Christian iba a salir. That in, we've already addressed this at the bench. Uh, I would ask that the court take some steps to admonish the witness with regard to her answer. That would be consistent with your ruling. So at this time, we'll do two things. Uh, the previous answer is stricken from the record. Uh, the witness is hereby admonished uh, that well, the witness should not be speaking about this subject and will ask to have the next question uh, posed. And uh, I think the uh, attorney understands that given my ruling, we should not be in this area. So go ahead. All right, ma'am. It was a bad question that I asked, okay? okay. Not your fault. Okay. Okay. I don't want you to tell the jury anything that Officer Romero told you. Okay. Okay. But do tell them how long you talked to Officer Romero. Muy poquito, menos de cinco minutos. Very little, less than five minutes. Did you ask when your um, nephew would be released? Yes. Uh, and did you also ask to see your nephew? No, we did not ask her that. After that conversation was done, were you offered any opportunity to see your nephew? No. No. Did you continue to wait? Yes. And you continued to wait in this little porch area? Yes. At some point in time, did you and your family decide to leave? Yes. And why? At that time, several hours had already gone by. It was close to 1.30 in the morning, and at that time, we decided that they weren't going to give us any information, and so we decided to leave. Were you ever able to reach Christian Bahena Rivera? No. No. At some point later, did you find out he had been arrested for murder? No. No. Now, ma'am, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Okay. Are you aware of uh, Christian Bahena Rivera's family in Mexico? Yes. Who did he live with in Mexico? Con sus padres y sus hermanas. With his parents and his sisters. Was he the oldest child of the family? Yes. In a Hispanic culture, is it customary for the oldest sibling to take care of the family? Uh, normally, yes. When Would you talk with family in Mexico? Yes. And, and were you encouraged to take good care of Christian Bahena Rivera? Yes, especially my husband. Why so? Because uh, for all of the uncles that he has here, he's the youngest one. So they wanted you to take him under his, the, your wing, is that right? 
Was yes. it your was it your understanding that he was taking care of family in Mexico? Yes. How so? Él era el que mandaba dinero para que ellos pudieran comer y él fue el que mandó dinero para que construyeran su casa. He was the one who was sending money so that they could eat and he was the one who was sending money so that they could build their house. No further questions. No tengo más preguntas. Mr. Brown, you may cross-examine. Mm -hmm. Ms. Cervantes, mm -hmm. how old was uh, Christian Bahena Rivera as of July 18th of 2018, if you know? I'm not sure, but I think like 20. So he was an adult. I'm sorry. Yes. You were at the sheriff's office on July, I'm sorry, on August 20th of 2018 from 8.30 to about 11.30 p.m. Is that correct? Until 1.30 in the morning. I'm sorry, I misspoke. 8.30 p.m. until 1.30 a.m. the next morning. Is that correct? Yes. And yes. Were, were you always there with the other person that you had uh, mentioned before? Yes. Did you ever leave the sheriff's office at any time in that same time frame? No. No. Between 8.30 p.m. and about 11.30 p.m., did you make or attempt any phone calls or text messages to Christian Rivera? Calling him. Okay. And did he ever answer the phone? No. No. Did he ever respond to the text messages? No. No. Did you meet Pamela Romero while you were at the sheriff's office on August 20th, 2018? Yes. She came out into the area where you were waiting? Yes. You had a conversation with her? Yes. She was pleasant to talk to? Yes. And you, do you know how long your conversation uh, took with Ms. Romero? Uh, I believe less than five minutes. And was that the only contact that you had with her on that evening while you were at the sheriff's office? Yes. Prior to July 18th of 2018, how often in any given week would you be in the presence of Christian Bahena Rivera? Uh, only once a week. Was that on average? Uh, y yes. And would that typically happen at your place of residence or some other place? He will always come to Luis's house. Luis who? Uh, Luis, Luis Medina. And, and tell us again who Luis Medina is. He's my brother-in-law. Did you know? Christian Bahena Rivera to drive a black Chevy Malibu? I only knew he had a black car.
Ms. Cervantes, thank you very much. That's all the questions I have. Ms. Fries, any redirect? Just briefly, during the times that you were around Christian Bahena Rivera, was he ever violent? No. No. Do you ever remember him fighting with anyone? I'm going to object against improper character evidence. Overruled. Witness may answer if she knows. No, I'm not a villain. No, he was not violent. Has he been respectful to uh, your your uh, brothers-in-law and your husband? Sí. Yes. Around children? Oh, sí. Oh, yes. Todos los niños lo querían. All the children loved him. Uh, he was a funny guy, correct? Again, no. proper character evidence and specific instances of conduct are not admissible at this time. Objections overruled. Witness may answer. Go ahead. Uh, yes. You enjoyed having him around, is that right? Yes. No further questions. Mr. Brown, any recross? No recross, thank you. Ma'am, thank you for being here. You're excused. Thank you very much. Defense may call its next witness. We call Iris Gamboa. Ma'am, let me stop you right there and I'm going to swear you in, okay? Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Okay. And you'll be, head right over to the, that chair, please. You may proceed when you're ready. Please state your full name and spell your full name for the record, ma'am. Iris Monares Gamboa. I R I S M O N A R R E Z G A M O G A M B O A. Where do you live, ma'am? 308 Mitchell Street, Southwest Cedar Rapids. Do you live there with anyone? My boyfriend and my daughter. What is your daughter's name? Paulina. And your daughter, Paulina, is how old? She's five. What, who is Paulina's father? Christian Baena Rivera. Now, ma'am, you are here under a subpoena, is that right? Yes. Uh, and someone uh, served you with a document saying that you must be here, is that right? Yes. I want you to take the, the jury through how you met <coughs> Christian Bahena Rivera. Uh, we met uh, at a quinceanera, which is like a sweet 16. That's where we met. And a quinceanera, that's a, a Hispanic uh, a celebration, yes. is that right? I mean, there would be nothing that would stop me from doing the same for my girls, but that, that is something that a Hispanic family traditionally celebrates, is that right? Yes. Describe for the jury what the celebration is. Uh, it's just pretty much like a sweet 16 you celebrate like from going from like a little girl to like a woman kind of. So you happen to be at this party, is that yes. right? And Christian Bahena Rivera also happened to be at this party, is that right? Yes. Approximately how long ago was it that you two met? Uh, 2013. Once you met, did you hit it off? Yes. Exchange numbers? Yes. Uh, start to, to date each other as a couple? Yes. Uh, 
at some point did you end up moving in together? Yes, when I got pregnant. All right, and that's pregnant with your daughter Paulina, is that right? Yes. Where did you two move in together? Uh, at my mom's house. And you lived there for a while, is that right? Yes. Uh, at some point did you decide to uh, establish your own residence? Yes. And how did you find a place to live a as a family? Well, he worked at the Yarby farm and we lived on their property. So he was able to, to work out something where he was able to live at Yarraby Farms, is that right? Correct. How long did you and Christian Bahena Rivera uh, reside together at that, that place at Yarraby Farms? Um, from 2016 to 2017. Your daughter was, uh, your daughter lived there, is that right? Yes. Approximately how old was she when you moved there? She was like a year, I believe. And when you broke up, uh, were you and, and my client able to uh, co-parent your daughter uh, as, as a mother and a father should? Yes. And specifically, uh, Christian worked very long hours, is that right? Yes. Uh, when he worked uh, and you were living with him, was he the primary support of your family? Yes. What approximately uh, were his hours at Yerby Farms? About 12 hours. So he would go to work early in the morning, is that right? Yes. And then he would come home around dinner time? Yes. How many days uh, would he work consecutively? Uh, he would only get uh, his days off every two weeks. So every two weeks he would get two days off. He'd get two days off. Yes. So it'd be two weeks on, two days off. Is that yes. right? When you and uh, Christian broke up, were you able to work out? Uh, without involving the courts, uh, a parenting arrangement. Yes. And what did you two work out? He would give me two hundred and fifty dollars every two weeks, because he, he got paid biweekly. So he'd get paid, and he'd pay you every every other week. Is that right? Yes. So that amount to about five hundred dollars a month for the care of Paulina. Is yes. that right? Did Christian have other obligations, to your knowledge, to his family in Mexico? Yes, he would uh, send money to his parents, and he was also uh, making a house over there for them. And what do you mean he was making a house over there for them? Yeah, he would send money and to start building a house over there for them. Now, is it pretty customary for someone to be taking care of their family in Mexico even if they're residing in the United States? Yes. Uh, is it unusual for uh, someone to have family uh, in, in Mexico that you know would be a parent or a sibling uh, that they care for? Yes. Ma'am, I, I, I hate to get personal but I, I know you were brought to this country uh, fairly early in life, is that right? Yes. Do you remember, you weren't born here, right? No. Do you remember anything about coming to this country? No. Do you remember, do you know how old you were? A year and a half. You are now a citizen, is that right? No, I have a uh, DACA. Okay, and describe what that is for the jury, they don't know. It's. Um, authorization to work or go to school legally. And, and that's something that you have because you've been in the United States so long, is that right? Yes. Do your parents <clears throat> enjoy the same privileges that you have? No. Uh, your father, is he in this country? No. Uh, and why not? Uh, he got deported. How is it that he got deported? I don't remember, honestly. If someone is an illegal immigrant in this country, uh, do they fear law enforcement contact? Yes. Why? 
Uh, because they know they'll get deported. So if someone has law enforcement contact for even a routine traffic stop, uh, is, is that someone, something that somebody would be fearful of? Yes. Now I asked you to provide, I'm sorry. Now ma'am, I asked you to provide some pictures of you and your daughter and Christian Bahena Rivera, is that right? Yes. And did you try to find the, I guess, the most recent pictures that you had available? I mean, somewhat, yes. Uh, I'm showing you Defendant's Exhibit B, B, B. Do you see that on the screen? Yes. And describe what that picture shows. Uh, that was my daughter's second birthday. And your daughter was three when uh, Christian Bahena Rivera was arrested, is that right? Yes. So that would have been the most recent uh, party that uh, you attended together, is that right? Correct. Describe where that party was at. Mm, that was at the Brooklyn Park. Who attended? Uh, Christian's family and myself. Now there's a, a big gold thing hanging out in front of the, the photo. Uh, can you describe what that is? That's a piñata. And, and what is a piñata, ma'am? It's like, it's full of candy and then the kids get a hit it and then the candy comes out. Is that something that's pretty traditional for a Hispanic birthday party? Yes. Your Honor, I'd offer Defendant's Exhibit B, B, B. Mr. Brown. I ask a question of the witness, Your Honor. Yes. Ms. Gamboa, when was that photograph taken? June, um, 2016? No, 2017. Your Honor, based on the age of the photograph, I'd object on uh, relevance grounds. Your Honor, I'd point out that my, my client, there's no pictures prior to August of 2018. Based on that record, uh, I am going to overrule the objection and B, B, B will be admitted into evidence. I'd move to publish the exhibit. Granted. And the photo's right in front of you, is that right? Yes. You and Christian, uh, you were not together uh, as a couple anymore in this photo, is that right? Yes. But you were still able to uh, attend family uh, obligations and family events together, is that right? Yes. How many people were at this party? Uh, about 25. And the family members would be uh, who? Um like his aunts and uncles. So it'd be Christian's family, is yes. that right? And even though uh, your daughter uh, no longer sees uh, Mr. Bahena Rivera, uh, she, she still maintained a relationship with his family, is that right? Yes. You know Alejandra Cervantes, is that right? Yes. Uh, and she's somebody that you still uh, are, are friends with, is that right? Yes. Uh, she spends time in, in different weekends with Paulina, is that right? Yes. Uh, and the rest of the family spends time with your daughter, is that right? Yes. And, and is that because you believe it's important for your daughter to know her father's family? Yes. Describe Christian Bahena Rivera's uh, reaction in that photo. Uh, he was happy that his daughter was happy. Uh, it was a good day for you. It was you. a good day, yes. Uh, describe his demeanor in general. Can you repeat your question? Describe how he was as a father in general. Uh, he was a really good father. He was responsible and he always looked after his daughter. 
He made sure to take care of her, right? Yes. Uh, he would send you money, even though there's no court order, right? Yes. Would he buy things for uh, Paulina uh, in addition to the support that he provided you? Yes. What sorts of things? Like shoes, toys. Has Christian Bahena Rivera ever been violent towards you? No. Has he ever been violent towards your daughter? No. Has he ever, I mean, I'm sure you two fought from time to time, right? Yes. There's a reason that you two broke up. Yes. Uh, but did Christian Bahena Rivera ever express any sort of anger that you believed was excessive? No. Other than the normal couples arguing, did he have any sort of anger problems? No. Now, you graduated from Brooklyn, is that right? Yes. Brooklyn is a high school that has a, a large Hispanic population, fair to say? Uh, no. Okay, uh, approximately what percentage would be Hispanic? Mm. Well, from what I recall, in my classroom, there were about three of us that were Hispanic. And how many, uh, what was your graduating class? Uh, about 45 to 50 people. Was race something that was talked about often in uh, Brooklyn? Yes. Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Sustained. Ma'am. You associated with your class, is that correct? Yes. I, I want to ask you about a man named Ulysses Felix. Who is that? That's my cousin. And did he also go to Brooklyn High School? Yes. What year was he in relation to you? I believe he was two years younger. Did Ulysses Felix know Christian Bahena Rivera? Yes. Has Ulysses Felix spent time at Christian Rivera Bahena's house? Yes. Did Ulysses Felix uh, know Dalton Jack? Yes. Speculation. Uh, overruled, the witness may know, excuse me, may answer if she knows. Yes. Did you know Dalton Jack? Yes. Do you have uh, an opinion as to Dalton Jack's demeanor? From what I recall, I, I remember he was pretty racist. No he further questions. Mr. Claver, any cross? Yes, Your Honor. Actually, before you do so, uh, Mr. Claver and Ms. Freeze, why don't you approach real quick? Mr. Claver, you may proceed with your cross-examination of this witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Gamboa, you lived with Christian Bahena Rivera for four years, isn't that right? Yes, about four years. And you were familiar with the type of vehicle he drove? Yes. And that was a black Chevy Malibu? Yes. And can you tell me again the date that you broke up with uh, Christian Bahena Rivera? April of 2017. And after you broke up, uh, you didn't have very much contact with him, is that correct? Uh, whatever was related to our daughter, yes. And how often would that have been? Um, 
pretty often, I mean, throughout the week, he would text and ask about her, and on his days off, he would come for her. Do you recall speaking with the defendant then in August of 2018? Yes. And during one of those conversations, the defendant told you that he had contact with law enforcement? Yes. And that contact was regarding the disappearance of Molly Tibbetts, isn't I that right? I believe so. And this was prior to his arrest, correct? Correct. And you talked to law enforcement at some point in time, isn't that right? Yes. Would that have been in August and September of 2018? I don't remember the exact date, but yes, around there. And during those uh, interviews with law enforcement, you were asked about the defendant. Yes. And you were asked about whether you were familiar with any mental health issues that you may have had. Correct. And you stated that you weren't aware that he had any. Yes. And you stated in that interview you weren't aware of any periods where he claimed to have blacked out. Yes. And you stated in that interview that you weren't aware of any periods uh, where the defendant had memory issues, correct? Correct. Thank you, Ms. Gamboa. I have no further questions for you. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am, thank you for being here. You're excused. Members of the jury, uh, that uh, completes our uh, work for the morning. We'll be in recess for lunch until 1 o'clock. want to remind you of your admonition. Make sure you're not discussing the case with anyone. Uh, make sure you're not doing any type of independent research or having any media exposure. You can leave your notebooks where they are. They'll be collected and held by the court attendant over the lunch recess. And again, let's be back here ready to go at 1 o'clock today. Thank you.